you would to the Gospel of John, chapter 7. And um, last class we were discussing that Jesus did not demand official glory. The class before that, we talked about he hid what men would exalt. And now we want to talk about trying to capitalize on official glory. <clears throat> and um, in John 7, this uh, particular part of the scripture was a time when all of Israel would gather to Jerusalem. And um, <clears throat> Jesus' family saw it as a good time to take advantage and to where Jesus could make himself important. They said, show thyself to the world. And, of course, he refused. He said his time was not yet come. And uh, when the time comes that God chooses to honor him, then he will be honored. So let's look at this. Uh, let's start just at verse 1. <clears throat> After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren, now this is not talking about Christian brethren, this is talking about his actual brothers and sisters. And for those of you who are familiar with the Virgin Mary, I got news for you, Mary's not a virgin anymore. <clears throat> these were born from her, okay? <coughs> um, his brethren therefore said unto him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. <clears throat> if thou do these things, show thyself to the world. And then says, For neither did his brethren believe in him. And then said Jesus unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is already ready. <clears throat> and uh, verse 7, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify of it that its works are evil. Go ye unto this feast, go ye up into this feast. I go not yet, yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet fully come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. <clears throat> but when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up into the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Notice those words. <clears throat> then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And let's skip on down to verse 14. Now, about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? And Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. <clears throat> and then finally, let's just read verse 18. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. <clears throat> All right. So here you have a really good example because his brothers are saying, look, you know, if you're, you know, this is a good chance. It's the Feast of Tabernacles. All of Israel is going to be coming up to Jerusalem. This would be a good time to show yourself to the whole world. Capitalize on your official glory. <clears throat> and Jesus wouldn't have any of it. Um, uh, and so it says that he waited. And then when it does say that he finally went up, it says he went up secretly. And um, I wrote, in the meantime, he would make himself of no reputation. In this world, he gets little honor that is freely given, so he carries himself as one who is veiled. When Jesus arrives at the feast, he does not do miracles to draw attention to himself, but teaches, always adding, the doctrine is not mine, and then hiding himself. 
He is not trying to capitalize on official glory. Now, folks, when someone starts to give you official glory, we would assume that's the time. This is God honoring me. This is the time to really capitalize on this and put my ministry forward, put my name forward, put my, you know, put my godliness forward, whatever, you know, how, however we view it. We do that not understanding kenosis. We do that thinking that God's going to get higher glory because you're more glorified. Well, you know, I mean, people think that, but if you word it like that, they go, well, that, that's not right. But, you know, I mean, that's what they do, you know. <clears throat> and uh, so uh, Jesus doesn't go up and try to make a big splash his brethren said, show yourself openly to the world. This is it. This is your big opportunity. Instead, he goes up secretly. It says they all start looking for him. But he's not showing himself. And then finally, when he does, he starts teaching them. And they start to try to give him some level of official glory. Did you hear it? You know, listen to this teaching. Where does this come? This is incredible. How does he know this, having never learned letters? And Jesus says, my doctrine is not my own, it's the Father's. He is very quick to stay in kenosis, <clears throat> to realize that even if God, even if God gives you official glory, it doesn't change your mission because it doesn't change your nature. That's the key. That's the key. But your mission is to walk as the prototype man. Your mission, and, and you know, um, oh, I think I wrote something fairly recently in a newsletter or so. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I taught it. I don't remember where. It's been something I've kicked around for a while. And that is this truth of Jesus being the example, an example to the believers, or Jesus being the life of the believer. Oh, I remember sharing it in one of these classes. We talked a little bit about it. <clears throat> and what we saw was there's only two scriptures that actually talk about Jesus being an example. And they were an example not of how you minister or of miracles or of any of that. They were an example of this nature. Because when Jesus walked as the Son of Man, or, listen carefully, when he walked as the incarnate Son, there was only one. And he was the prototype that we were supposed to examine in the Gospels as the, and remember prototype being the word from which uh, firstborn comes from, <coughs> as an example of what all that would be made after that prototype, the firstborn among many, after that image and, and, and of that species. And so he is both example and he is the example of life and he is the life. He is the example of life as the incarnate son as the only begotten because he's the only one this is the example but in the new creation he's no longer just an example to us he is the life of us <laughs> and and the good news is you don't have to look in a, at an example and try to copy it now it's it's called the resurrection the resurrection has changed the game. <laughs> the game was, he's the example. To the 12, he was the example. To the multitudes, he was the example. To the 70 sent out, he's the example. But in resurrection, he no longer stands as your example, except if your life is contrary, and then you look at the prototype and you say, and or someone says to you, this is what you're supposed to be like. <clears throat> All right. So that means that kenosis, listen carefully, kenosis doesn't just belong to Jesus. 
How do I know that? Let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And what does he begin to describe? The kenosis of Christ. Does it get any plainer than that? No, no, Jesus died. Jesus suffered. Jesus went through all this so we wouldn't have to. That's what you hear. That's what you hear. Yeah, it's true. Jesus d did all this so we wouldn't have to as unregenerate, you know, reprobates. But as sons in the image of Christ, we have the same selfless nature. And what someone who doesn't have this nature described as having to go through this and not wanting to, therefore Jesus did it so we won't have to, if you don't have that nature, that's, that would be your stance. I don't want to go through this. I don't want to. It's, it's a trial. It's an ordeal. It's a, uh, it's a burden. It's a terrible lifestyle. Are, are you listening? To someone who doesn't have this nature, that's right. But for some who do, they're not looking at, at the life of Christ and the nature of Christ. First of all, it's not as difficult as it would be to them. Because it's, I'll say it this way, this is, we, this is how we understand it. It's second nature to us, but in truth, that's the wrong term. It's first nature to us. Or more specifically, it's Christ's nature. When something is nature to you, it's not hard. Is anybody following this? When it's, the, it's your nature, it's not hard. It's only hard when it's not your nature, you know. And so, why are you putting all this on us? Well, I'm not really. I'm trying to, to, to get you conformed to the image of Christ. Well, I don't want to conform if that's what it is. Okay, now there's, there's the, okay, then there's the issue. Then say that's the issue. <laughs> don't, don't say this other stuff. The nature of Christ does not, you, you don't hear Jesus having a hard time with any of this. You know, even seated on the throne, he's a lamb. He's not this great king and all this glory and all of the way that we, we think that he's going to be portrayed. He's going to be portrayed as a slain little lamb. There's your king. Here's your king. Well, where do I get that from? When Jesus was beaten and bloody and crown of thorns shoved down on his head and blood running down and slapped and mocked and everything. G, uh, uh, Pilate brought him out and he said, shall I turn loose Barabbas who wasn't beaten, who was just fine and da 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 or shall I turn loose Jesus? And they said, give us Barabbas. And he said, here is your king. My God, there is the greatest truth you could have ever imagined. That is your king right there. That's your king. That's not going to be your king. <laughs> That's your king. No way with him. Not that. Ugh. Wouldn't want that. Well, so when, when the king divides the sheep from the goats, right? When the king divides the sheep from the goats, and they're all mixed up and hadn't divided yet. The goats look up there and they go, oh, oh, that king looks an awful lot like these fellas, these sheep guys here. And he's going to be making the decision? Anybody following this? The goats will say, this is bad. <laughs> and it will be bad. Because they will be divided off from him and separated forever from him because they are not nature. You, you see, he didn't say, okay, all the good people over here and all the bad people over here, ready, go. Well, first of all, this side would be full. Nobody would be over there. Everybody would think they're good, which would condemn every one of them because it's the wrong tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Same tree, wrong, ah, you're all loose, you know. He didn't say, we're okay, you know, let's look at your works. 
He said, let's look at your nature. And when the screen went from works to nature, they're only sheep and goats. Well, that's, that's an examination of the nations that stand before him. Well, what about black and white? What about brown and yellow people or reds? You know, skin people. What? No, no. The light that he flashes in that room shows no nations, no skin color. It shows nature. And then he says, This is what you are seeing in this room now is the way I have always viewed. You are now seeing through my eyes. And they're going, Well, why didn't someone tell us this? He'll say, well, I said somebody. You remember that Randy guy? <laughs> and he'll say, he actually mentioned it several times. <laughs> like every sermon, maybe. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So, um, their whole thing, this, the, his brothers, his brothers, you know, I mean, this is blood, this is close, this is, but they're not of the same. He is a different species than they are. So they don't understand. You can't talk to them. You can't communicate with them. You can talk, but you can't communicate. You can't get through. So they will say to you, Dude, you're the oldest of the brothers. You were endowed with special gifts, just like Elijah, who could do miracles, or Elisha, who could do miracles, or Moses, or all the other people that came that were great, but just people. <laughs> so... Do like they did. Get out there and get known. We know them. We know their names. They're popular. They're famous. People still talk about them. So go up to Jerusalem and show off, baby. Jesus said, no, I'm, I, you know, that's not how I operate. You go up. So they went up, and then he went up, <laughs> but secretly, lest they say, he's here, he's over there, it's our brother, it's our brother, it's our big brother, and big brother's watching you. <laughs> so Jesus doesn't do it, but Jesus does go up to the feast, why? Because it's, it has spiritual significance. He can't do anything but go up. They don't understand. Nobody understands. Father understands. So he goes up. And he can't just be quiet because he's self-giving. Do you see what I'm saying? He's not a show-off, so he can be quiet in that vein. He's not full of pride, so he can be quiet in that vein. But there's one vein he can't just totally shut down and be quiet, and that is he's self-giving. So he calls him to himself. And instead of showing uh, gifts and healings that would just stir them more towards that vein, he sits down and he teaches him, and he just starts sharing with them. Well, of course, they're all caught up in there. Oh, my God, he's teaching. Wow, how did he learn all this stuff? It's really good. You're really good, you know. And then Jesus says, it's not my doctrine. It's not. I'm just sharing with you what the fathers thought. It's not. I, I didn't do it. It's not about me. I'm here to just serve you. I'm serving you the word of God. And I'm going to do it because it's my nature to do it, not for the reward that 10,000 will gather or people will be moved and 
will change the world or any other reason. It's just him. It's just him. It's him at work in me. It's the Father. It's the Father's doctrine. It's his words. And so, boom, they get into all this arguing. Well, he's this, and he's a great one. No, he's not, and all this stuff. So finally, Jesus just caps it off with verse 18. He that speaks of himself seeketh his own glory. What are we talking about? Official glory or glory of nature? But we're talking about glory. Okay. What kind of glory are you going to capitalize on? What kind of glory do you want? Everybody wants glory on some level. You know, even if you've been a good mom or a good dad, you'd like a little glory, a little official glory. You know what I'm saying? Can I get an old me? I mean, yeah, it's true. It's just true. But, but, while that can be okay, that can be okay, there is this one part. He that speaks of himself seeks his own glory. The only reason why you're talking there, buddy, <laughs> is because you want people to know that you, or you want, you know, and you know, Jesus, Jesus sometimes would say stuff from his angle, and he would say, well, da-da-da-da, and they said, and this is right here in this little line here. They say, well, then you're seeking your own glory because you're speaking of yourself. <laughs> and he goes, okay. I can actually speak of myself and not be glorified by myself. But that, I can't explain that to you because for sure if you're doing it, <laughs> It's selfish. Well, you're doing it. We just don't always know the motives. We don't know the motivations. We don't know what's going off in what is the Lord. And I say it like that because Christians can be of God, but it not be God. Christians can be seeking an agenda just like they did when they were a sinner. The difference is now they're seeking an agenda within the realm of Christianity. And if you don't get your agenda settled, if you don't get to the place you want to after putting that much effort into it, then to heck with it. And I know for a fact that's happened through Bible school students that have come here that wanted to climb the ladder, that wanted to be something, that wanted a title, but when they got the title, they didn't get the official glory that came with it, and they got upset over it because they didn't get the official glory with it because they weren't after the position of being a servant of all, and they weren't after a title per se. They want the title if the Official glory comes with it. But this is the wrong place for that. This, this is the wrong place. Oh, man. I came to the wrong place. <laughs> that's, what, that's the conclusion. That, no, they, don't, they, don't, they say I came to the wrong place, but it's because you're, you're wrong here. Okay. okay, that's fine. That's fine. But it's a misunderstanding of kenosis. It's a total lack of understanding the nature of Christ. It misses the essence of his being, and it seeks for what he has. And this, is, this, is, this was the, the failure of Satan, of Lucifer. I will be like the Most High God. Now, what do you think he meant when he said that? That's over in Isaiah 14. What do you think he meant? I'm going to be just like the Lamb... I'm going to be just like the lamb. I'm going to be so self-giving. I'm just going to be, you know. No, he didn't even see the essence of God. He saw what God had in terms of official glory. And he said, I will be like the most high God. I will sit in the sides of the north. I will uh, walk among the stones of fire. I will uh, mount up, you know, on high. I will be exalted above the stars. Well, every bit of that is official glory. 
And if you can't get the glory of nature down here, there's no need God giving you official glory because you'll pervert every ounce of it. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And, and, you know, as long as we keep this in theology and books or, or in theology and concepts, we can continue any way we want. But the day will come when that, the light switch will be switched where it only sees by nature and you can't continue any longer. Well, that day's already coming. That day's already come. Jesus said, your day has already come. It's here. We know what you are. You're goats. You butt people that get in your way. You, you know, and I've told this story before, but when my wife and I were missionaries in Jamaica, you know, they put me in charge of the goats. I didn't know anything about goats. I didn't know anything about any of the stuff hardly there. It was all country stuff, and I was a city boy. I didn't know you don't pick up something. You know, one of the requirements that we had is you, if you see something on the ground, you pick it up. Any of the early students here remember that that used to be you were not, when I say not allowed, it was not our way for you, you to walk across any part of this property and see something on the ground and just walk past it. You, you picked it up, and, you, and, that's, and we all said, this is Jesus, and we want to be this way. And it was Jesus to us. Now you tell somebody to do that, and well, why don't I do this? That's somebody else's responsibility. I'm in a labor union. That's not my job. You know? I specialize. You know? But, but I, you know, oh, and, I, and I actually learned that, not at Berean, but I learned that from Brother King in Jamaica who said, when you walk across the property, you see a piece of paper, you pick it up. So I saw a piece of paper, I'm picking it up, and this goat come up and butted me in the rear and knocked me down. I went, what the heck? And so I was telling Brother King the story, and he said, well, pretty much any time you bend over like that, they'll do that. He says, that's that, that a revelation to you? Well, it, it was then, it was an epiphany. It was more than a revelation. <clears throat> And uh, and then we had to. I had to make sure that they were tied up because if you didn't, you know where the first place they'd go. Yeah, we had we had a big garbage area where you dumped the garbage and you burned it. That's how you dealt with stuff in the mission field. Okay, and so it's just a big dump area and you dumped everything and you burned it and a lot of times it smoldered nothing. But once it went down. If, you, if those goats got loose, that's the first place they'd go. And I mean, I, I saw them chewing on tin cans and stuff. I'm just going, you know, golly, dudes, don't you have any sense? You know? Well, this is good. Mm, I love garbage. Feed me more. What's, go ahead, pastor, feed me more. I like this stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm going to spread the word. This is a good place, this here garbage dump. This is a cathedral. I'm sorry, don't call this a garbage dump. This is a cathedral. The cathedral of praise. What's well, good, whatever it is. Mm. So I learned, and I learned firsthand, and I learned over a several year period. And it made me comprehend God's view. It made me comprehend. And, and sheep, if you, if you can lead off, they'll follow you. If they know you, they'll follow you. But goats won't do that. Man, they're a mess. They go anywhere they want to go. You know, if there's a flock of sheep 
and you drive something through the middle of them, it's like parting the Red Sea. They just simply, whoosh, and they, there's one flock here and one flock there, and you drive your, your little ATV through the middle of them, they just, whoosh, and then they close back up. I mean, it's just amazing. They just all together, and they're just hanging out and everything. Goats, you know, I mean, they just take off all over the place, you know. Well, anyway. They say that sheep are really dumb. Goats are smarter than sheep. You know why they call them dumb? Because they stick together and they're not difficult. That's why they, they say, well, you're just dumb. You're dumb staying there. <laughs> you're dumb. If you're smart like us, you'd eat garbage. and <laughs> You know. And if anybody ever got in your way, you'd butt the heck out of them. And you'd let everybody know that you're a, you're a butter. <laughs> if you butt them, as, if they do you wrong, you'll, you'll butt them. But no, you just r roll over. You just act like a sheep. Well, that's what Jesus is. And Jesus doesn't lift himself above the situation. He lives within it because his goal is not to capitalize on official glory. His goal is to manifest the essence of a nature that will impress us. And to some, their eyes will be open. We'll, we haven't got to that yet, but we'll get to that probably next Thursday. To some, your eyes become open to the essence of the thing. All right. So just reading this final few words here. His own brothers did not understand him. Go up to the feast and show thyself. Take advantage of the situation of the feast to further yourself. Take advantage of the conference to further yourself. Take advantage of the, I'm trying to think of all the opportunities for official glory. Anybody following this? I, I can't think of them all. Take advantage of their openness to you to build your official glory among them. Doesn't it seem crazy to not do that? Jesus said, my, my time has not yet come. If, if the Father wants to glorify me, he'll glorify me. But I'm not going to set about doing that for myself. If God never wants to glorify me, then I will give him the glory of nature. <laughs> and I'll be not only content with that, that is the end. Remember what we talked about last class. That is the end. The means is the end. It's not getting you somewhere. It is where you're going. Take advantage of the situation of the feast to further yourself. His way was foreign. Jesus' way was foreign to all men. David was despised for dancing. It brought glory to God, but even his own wife looked at him bad from then on. You, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Yes, I'm just in love with Jesus. You know. Well, we're we're proper people. We're you don't you shouldn't do that stuff. That lowers our official glory when you do that stuff in the eyes of people. Now think about it. Dancing naked's not a good idea. I mean, it just takes people that, you know, it, you, God's been blessing you to build your official glory and you're tearing it down. And all he could think about is, I'm just loving on the Lord. And the proof that it was okay with God is the wife that said that ends up being barren and never, you know, and is taken away from him, probably to her delight given to some other man. 
And David goes on. David goes on. Bathsheba, Ab Abigail, and whoever is added. And of course, when you say Bathsheba, the average person, they go, well, that's wrong, that's bad. And you don't even know Bathsheba until you've studied God's view of her because Jesus was of the line of David and Bathsheba. That line came straight down and culminated in, the, in Jesus himself. One of the most extraordinary realities there is. So I'm not going to try to explain all that right now, but I'm telling you, you know, you want to you want to live for official glory. You want to promote yourself. You want to think and put all your thinking behind that and all your consternation about when you don't get it. Okay, well, where does that end? Even the disciples who lost advantage for following Jesus were looking for it in the coming kingdom. Right? They were looking for it in... <clears throat> uh, I'm trying to think of the... They said, haven't we forsaken all? They want to know what they're going to get for living this way. It was still... They're after official glory. Uh, the glory of nature to them was a temporary thing. And it was bartering chips for something that they wanted in terms of official glory. Yes. Yes. Passing through Samaria and they weren't received. And so, with yes. James, John and James, said, Well, rain down fire on them. And Jesus says, You know, it's spirit you're right. They were mad because they weren't getting Jesus' official glory. Right. So, they, they felt like Jesus had a right to move right. out of nature. We'll get into some of that. Uh, that's very, very well put, though. And, and I think timely. That's exactly right. Very well put. <clears throat> because uh, what. Uh, Eventually, I'm going to get into those scriptures, and I'm going to show you how Jesus adjusts for, uh, forward in official glory when it is given and backward when it is taken away from him. And, he, and I can show you over and over that he does that in the scriptures, that he adjusts to however the people treat him and with whoever, whatever degree they honor him, he'll move in that. And he easily slips out of official glory without any problem at all. <laughs> Don't you just love the Lord? Anybody really love the Lord? I just love the Lord. My goodness, he's just beautiful to me. And when I say he's beautiful, I'm not talking about what he did for me yesterday. I'm talking about he is beautiful, period. Doesn't require him doing anything for me. It just requires that we truly comprehend his essence and just, just love him. Just love him back for that. <clears throat> let's see. Maybe I should. Uh, how much time you got on your? Okay. Uh, let's turn to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Y'all getting anything out of this class? Matthew 26 and verse 7. I'm going to deal with this scripture later on when we start getting into the houses and the tables that Jesus sat at and all the different people and the way they responded to him and therefore the way he responded back to them. But I want to just make a reference to this. So let's start at um, uh, verse 6. Matthew 26, verse 6. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper... There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he was eating. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose? And here is the, the thing I want you to see. Is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much. Okay, but let's sanctify it and given to the poor. <laughs> when Jesus understood it, because 
it doesn't just come to him instantly because he's not that way. <laughs> when Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? Any of you ladies ever thought that? Why trouble you the woman? <laughs> Why don't you pick on yourselves? Quit picking on us. Anyway, sorry. <clears throat> Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, where, wherever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, and be told from a memorial of her. Um, let me just read this. Position and title, along with the influences that such a place can bring to us, is honored and commended by the world. Position and title and all the influences that it can bring to us is honored and commended by the world. We seek out. You know, th I mean, think about this. Somehow in the world, at the beginning, was released this magic woofle dust that infiltrated the spores and pores of all humans that said, while we live on this earth, we've got to get ahead of the Joneses. While we live on this earth, we have to get official glory and hopefully more than those around us. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound, you know? Why we, while we live here, we must promote ourselves and da 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 da. Now, you know, that ain't right. <laughs> Why couldn't it be that that magic does not be magic at all, just be the sprinkling of the DNA of Christ within us that says, let's get lower and lower so that we can push people up higher. The lower we can get, the better angle we'll be at to be able to push people up. And why, why, would, why couldn't that just be glorious to everybody? Yeah! Why, why, you know, I mean, think, why, why wouldn't everybody just go, gosh, that's a wonderfully creative idea. Let's all live to help others first and, and not just think about ourselves. Let's see, what are the words just before the Kenosis scriptures? Let no man look upon his own things, but upon those of others. And it goes on. There's more to it. That scripture just came to my mind. Wouldn't it be wonderful if a new hippie movement came into being? And that new hippie movement was fostered by a spirit that says, let's push everybody else forward. Let's help them achieve what, you know, greatness at our expense if necessary. Let's, well, you said, I doubt that's going to happen. Well, I do too. Because we've got something better than a new hippie movement. We've got the word of God. We've got the heart of the Lord. We've got what some call Christianity. We've got the makings of it, and we've got it right here. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we all felt that way at every given moment? Yes. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we got so excited about it we wanted to proliferate that around the world? Yes. Wouldn't it be wonderful if in our desire and zeal to do that, others did catch on and became self-giving themselves. Yes. You know what? A new hippie movement has begun. <laughs> but it's not a hippie thing at all. It's a Jesus thing. And it's right here. You say, well, it doesn't look like it's taken off very well. I thought the whole point is you get lower. If 
You seek to exalt yourself in his kingdom, you'll be brought down. He that humbles himself shall be exalted. And he'll, he'll be exalted so that he can start pushing other people up. He'll use whatever he's got for helping others and not to promote himself to look better. Well, all right, let me qualify that on a personal level so you get this. I was a hippie. I, I liked portions of what that was all about. It was incredible in many ways, but it was still Adam, okay? And therefore, the seeds of destruction were in it from the beginning. <clears throat> but what stuck with me is an incredible desire to see something out of the ordinary come forth, something that was creative, something that was different, something that was not selfish, something that had the same feel but didn't end with everybody stealing one another's drugs or, you know, getting, getting paranoia so bad that you can't, you know, trust anybody. You know what I mean? Where it degenerated down, down, down. No, but something alive and real and in the air and, and, and Christ glorifying. But my initial thought was, because I was also a Jesus freak, was that we'd all run around and go, glory to God. And that would be it, you know. And, and just, uh, you know. I mean, I remember, <laughs> this is an honest, true story. I remember... Being a Jesus freak, long hair, you know, puffy see-through shirts and bell bottoms with uh, moccasins or sandals or, you know, depending on what, what I was doing. And I remember going in this grocery store and having to buy something and I gathered up my things and I walked to the front <laughs> and this was, you know, you don't see this much now, but back then they had smaller stores, smaller grocery stores that actually... Some of them only had like two aisle, two things that you could go through, you know, two checkers and two things, you know. And walked up, and I don't know I, what, how I hit it, but both of them were just incredibly long lines. And I walked up, and I looked, and I went, praise Jesus, because I'm just so in love with the Lord. Instead of going, this, you know, oh, my God, I'm, Oh, praise Jesus. And everything get back, you know. So I just said, praise Jesus. And the whole place looked up, turned her back at me, and it was like the Red Sea parted. And just let me go. Down. I just went, well, thank you. Praise God, you know. And I don't know what they were thinking they, they had there. But, but it was, you know. Well, you know, that's what? <laughs> I think it was their shock to see something as weird as me that was vocal about it. <clears throat> but, yeah, and I'm sure that that really was what it was. But, but in my mind, what the Jesus movement is is that kind of stuff where people are just affected by the Lord. And then as the years go by, the Father begins to show me it's not that kind of a thing at all. To bring me glory is not going to have people get out of their way so that you get your way. Yeah. Oh gosh, I thought that was so you. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I thought it was so you, and I was so proud of that moment. He said, "Well, you shouldn't have been." <laughs> <clears throat> and so you you realize you realize. There still is a potential, but it's not going to be in the same way. It's going to come through dying seeds. It's going to come through those who are willing to lose that others might gain. Well, how many volunteers are you going to get for that little army? Yes. It's like Kenosis class is like hearing all these things that you know you cannot do. I mean, it really, it's like whoa, you know, you give us one mile, now we have 20 new miles that Kenosis presents to us that we right. know we are too selfish to ever do the first mile. And I, I was just looking in Matthew where the only person who heard what Jesus said um, when he gave him the Beatitudes was a leper said, hey, listen, if you want to make me clean, I'll be clean. 
And, 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 and then, you know, the leper offering is the whole application of the cross. Well, you know, we can't do this movement without the cross smack dab in the center of our hearts because we are desperately, totally selfish apart from Christ. And we can hear this and we can hear hippie movement and all that, but I just, you know, having been raised here in a place that preaches Christ and him crucified in the cross constantly, you're going, yes, we can actually walk in kenosis because the cross eradicates our selfish. Because we won't do this. We can't do this. We never will, no matter how much we love it and our hearts burn in us. Only Jesus is going to do this in us because we are so selfish. Amen. So selfish without him. Amen. So my example and you know, the, of, of the, this quote-unquote gift of praising God and then God opening the door to me. I, I wrote this. What is given as a gift to us by God is used for our own profit. And everybody thinks that's okay. And promotes it and writes books that sell a lot. Success in life or whatever, you know. Um, a life of kenosis is counted as waste. Remember, she poured out her best. <laughs> we want to have our best exalted, and, and um, um, we want to capitalize on it. And she, she wasn't capitalizing on it. She didn't give it in such a manner that everybody would go, oh, you know, all the poor would come to her and go, oh, you helped us so much. And all the disciples would go, that was so big of you giving that. She just poured it out on Jesus, lost it for Jesus' glory. And, you know. It was considered waste. A life of kenosis was counted as waste because the advantages might have been retained for the possessor instead of this constant pouring out and loss. To the degree that we, we are ignorant of God's purposes in kenosis is the degree that we will call selflessness waste. What is holy will be perceived as ugly. What is the highest memorial will be perceived as waste. Jesus does not use situations of their neediness for him to explain himself. All right, I'm going to stop right there. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. May he communicate your heart, not my preaching. May we perceive your essence and not your power or your glory on an official level. And in so doing, may we be reflectors of you. May we truly reflect you and may, Father, you be glorified by seeing your son. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're dismissed.